And good morning, everyone around the world in the United States, Europe, Asia, South America, Latin America. I'm Steve Ferreira, and you're watching Navigate B2B. Such a pleasure to be with you today. My normal job takes me as CEO of Ocean Audit, a ocean freight refund consultancy company here in beautiful Hartford, Connecticut. And uh, my new venture is Vessel.Voyage. It's a real-time pre-auditing tool that I'm offering free of charge for all importers. I can't wait to talk more about it on LinkedIn. And you can find me on LinkedIn at Steve Ferreira or Ocean Audit. So really a privilege to be here today on the air at FreightWaves. Thank the whole FreightWaves team and crew for producing and directing such a great show. And it's just an honor to be here. We're heading into supply chain, global supply chain week at FreightWaves, including the ocean freight maritime segment of the global supply chain coming up next week and then focusing in on March 1 through 3 on the ocean side of things. And you'll be able to see me speak exclusively to Gary Vaynerchuk, so social media icon and the must-have speaker on everyone's to-do list. Sorry, uh, even beats Bill Gates in my opinion. I didn't say that. <laughs> It's great to be here, and uh, I am totally stoked to uh, bring you the, uh, how should I say it, the, this is the garnishing on your plain vanilla sandwich, your, your plain ham and cheese without the cheese. We're going to put the cheese on, the tomatoes, the garnish, We've got a great show, power packed with a lot of different things today. I think it's Friday, and it's great to be able to catch up with you guys on a lot of the things I'm following and a lot of the things that are piquing the interest of the business community around us. So um, tighten up, belt in, sit down, and enjoy today's episode of Navigate B2B. First thing I'd like to talk about is a update on the um, seemingly endless C. You see what I did there? on Trans-Pacific containers falling into the ocean. I don't have any easy way to say that. But you know, I've been in, in the industry for 30 plus years and I've never really seen the type of stack planning on the, on the uh, vessel stowage where, and I guess it was bound to happen, right? The vessel capacity being so uh, heavily laden with um, overbookings. So the, the vessels are at full capacity. So the stacks are pretty high and uh, the Pacific Ocean is a, is a pretty unrelenting place, you know, as it relates to what it can do to a uh, container ship. You know, a container ship is, it's interesting. You know, there's a, a district in New York City, not far from where I live here in Connecticut, the Flatiron District, right? And, if you think of an iron, right? I always thought of my mom's ironing board and her iron. She's ironing our clothes. And it's like, you know, an iron is so generic, right? And um, the flat iron district in New York is, you know, to me, it brings back my boyhood memories of my mom ironing clothes, but it's also very generic, like a container ship. And I think a container ship, and you'll see in the segment today, they have lives of their own, right? They all have different... Um, experiences on each vessel voyage. And I think that's what makes um, uh, ocean freight shipping and container shipping, both from a shipper, beneficial cargo owner, freight forwarder, container shipper, uh, container carrier operator, charter operator, you know, um, dynamic. And the fact that everyone's making great money at it, you know, makes that generic iron uh, a la container ship into some pieces of gold. But sometimes those pieces of gold slough off and fall into the ocean. And the more recent episode on the Maersk Essen, where she lost some seven to 800 containers overboard and did, then did a uh, maintenance and repair down in Mexico, diverted from LA into Mexico. And I checked on maritime traffic last night. She's still down in Mexico, starting to, I think, to make her way slowly up to LA. So the interesting thing on the Maersk Essen, my first takeaway of your, your uh, dressing up your generic sandwich today, so to speak, is the Maersk Essen, um, she sailed from Asia around 
12, 15, December 15th, December 18th, around that time frame, right, give or take. And she's now due back in uh, Long Beach, L.A. Um, can't remember whether it's Port of L.A. or Long Beach for her, but I think L.A. Um, so she's due in on March 4th. So it's a two and a half month, you know, journey that the cargo that survived, um, you know, in the stacks or below deck will take from Asia to L.A. 2.5 months. And exclusive news, uh, only Ocean Audit, uh, Navigate B2B, Freight Waves here as the, uh, I have the manifest of who had the most containers on that ship. Now, point of caution, right? I'm not implying that any of the following names lost cargo. I just want to talk about the cargo that we know about that is in pretty high quantity on that ship. And what, you know, kind of, I mean, how, how we might think about it um, when she discharges. So I have six or seven names listed. And the first is Dick's Sporting Goods. Dick's leads the pack with 16 or so, uh, maybe more, but 16 containers that, you know, I kind of heroed front and center that they have on their ship of uh, various type exercise machinery. Um, now, it obviously it wasn't meant for Christmas, right? Because it's more of this COVID phenomena that you're seeing with Peloton and Icon and, and Nordic Track and these guys, right? By the way, I think Icon and Nordic, Nordic Track are the same. <clears throat> Forgive me. So, um, so Dix has 16. Um, Zenus, the infamous, uh, and I mean it in a great way because they just have so much cargo. Uh, Zenus is a mattress, um, box spring. Uh, bed furniture designer, but predominantly known for their mattresses, um, lower lower cost, good quality mattresses. So Zenus has fourteen. Uh, Ambu A M B U is a really interesting company. Um, I believe it's Chinese owned, but they have uh, eleven containers on the uh, Mars Gessen. And when you go to Ambu's homepage, they speak about their COVID. Um, their ability to detect, not detect COVID, but instruments that they use. It's a medical instrument company. Medical instruments used different scopes, endoscopy, uh, endoscopy, yeah, um, scopes that they use. So Ambu had 11 containers on that. And so Ambu is making a big deal that, you know, they're kind of a COVID hybrid company. And I know UPS handles the, I want to say like the warehousing or the brokerage for Ambu. So it's interesting. I don't know if those containers, you know, hypothetically, you know, whether there was any talk about maybe getting into Mexico, getting the materials out of those containers and, uh, you know, flying them up to the U.S., depending on what was in them. Right. Again, this is all speculation, but I want to take my audience inside some of the back scenes that you know, probably and are happening or did happen with regards to the Essen. The other um, company I just men mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, Icon Fitness had 10 containers plus on that Maersk Essen. And Icon is always kind of going head to head. I did a story, or I contributed to a Business Insider story in the last couple of weeks about Peloton versus uh, Icon, um, both manufacturer in, in China and Taiwan. And Icon does the Nord Nordic Track line as well as other lines of uh, exercise equipment. And so um, Icon had quite a bit of containers on, on that vessel. And it's, an, again, interesting that the, the exercise the theme is so prevalent, you know, in, we, in, a, in a COVID and post-COVID or COVID-2 environment or consumerism type 2 environment. Interestingly, a company called Virgin Scent, Virgin Scent Manufacturing, had 10 containers of hand sanitizer on that vessel. And Edsel, E-D-S-A-L manufacturing, had nine containers. It's interesting with Edsel is that Edsel also has had uh, recently in the last two or three days um, a recall on some of their product made in China, um, some certain uh, models and makes of some heavy lifting shelving. Uh, Edsel makes shelving. And um, again, they had a recall because these shelves were, I guess, I'm not sure if they were toppling over or they couldn't stand their their skated weight on the um, um, that they declared to the uh, 
you know, authorities in terms of the FDA, not the FDA, but uh, uh, Consumer um, uh, Affairs Division. Can't remember the <laughs> the exact name here in the U.S., but you know, everything is regulated in terms of like it's like when you go to IKEA and you buy a uh, a bookcase, right? They always recommend that you attach it to the wall so it doesn't come crashing down. So consumer protective safety um, regulations, I guess, were impacted with uh, Edsel. But um, you know, all those companies, with the exception of uh, uh, Virgin uh, Scent, who I don't recognize, I recognize as very strong, um, very uh, prosperous importers that you know um, have a lot of cargo consistently. And so you wonder, right, whether the inventory impact um, was negligible on those, or whether those you know were earmarked for some sale, whether they'll have to be, whether the uh, materials will have to be sold in a you know, more of a liquidation or a closeout market. So there's a lot of potential ramifications for what might, what might happen to the cargo on the Maersk Essen. Some of it is perfectly great. I mean, it's obviously, it's, you know, it's just delayed and can go right into uh, inventory. Oh, I should also mention one of my favorite companies on it, uh, some great folks in, in Utah, a company called Cricut. Um, they uh, are in the home hobby mode of... Uh, sewing and and hot stamping and and you know creative things with fabrics and cricket is a, a real up and coming company I have a lot of respect for their uh, ownership and their uh, their executives there uh, and they're um, uh, a fairly uh, upscale in terms of uh, when i say upscale they've really gone from you know 0 miles an hour to 100 miles an hour they're uh, rampantly uh, growing their their import department so that's off to cricket and i'm sorry for everyone that might have been impacted by the by the Maersk Essen uh, incident, um, and, and Freight Waves um, has reported a, a third incident this week. Um, I don't have much uh, many stats on or much information about the new incident. I believe it was another Maersk vessel. So I think the takeaway here is that we really need to start looking at um, you know the stowage, and uh, you know hopefully we won't be uh, doing such high stacking. And it started to, started me to think about. Um, the types of premium services, right, that are offered out there. You know, we've seen um, all types of guaranteed service. We've seen, uh, you know, bolted on type services where you get a guaranteed space, you get a guaranteed transit time, uh, you get a guaranteed transit date, uh, uh, and all this, right, all these extra you know, bolted on services. But, you know, the one thing I haven't seen, and this is kind of a call out to the market to see if it's a, uh, it's something that there's an interest. What about a premium for below deck stowage? You know, under the hatch. I mean, you know, certainly you look at some of the more consistent companies on these vessels like um, uh, Peloton or, or um, Icon or um, Dow Chemical or, you know, any of the, the majors, right? They're going to have cargo consistently. Um, it makes sense. I mean, if I'm an importer today, Steve Ferrer Import Company. And by the way, you're watching uh, Navigate B2B. I'm your host, Steve Ferrer, CEO of Ocean Audit, Hartford, Connecticut. And we're talking about you know different techniques uh, coming out of the Maersk Essen incident. But if I'm an importer, I think having a below deck stowage, um, it, it's. I don't know if I'm willing to pay you know 1,500 bucks for it as a premium, but I think that what's happening is these vessels are leaving, and you know. Uh, the high profile shippers, like I just mentioned, Dick, Zenus, Icon, you know, Edsel, to bring in cargo in at the last minute, that vessel is fully configured. Where's that vessel? Where's that cargo going to go? Right? It's going to get stowed on on the, the higher uh, the higher deck uh, on top of the stack. Right. And again, that's going to be the most uh, susceptible. So I guess the other thing to look at is just make sure that if you're, um, you know, bringing in cargo late to the gate. And that's something your steamship line is telling you. Please make sure your marine insurance is up to date, up to snuff. You've got casualty. You've got uh, um, you know general average, uh, you know which is the most serious of, of seriousness when it comes to marine insurance. So maybe it's a good gut check, right, as we start to head into uh, into the second phase. Um, you know, I, I wanted to also talk about since we're on kind of like um, Marisk and container ships. I wanted to talk about um, a, a new concept that many of my audience might not know about. And I kind of compared here 
uh, Zim uh, versus Maersk. And I wanted to guys show you guys that, you know, you think about, you know, what, what's different about these, this, these two photos here, right? You've got Zim on the right and Maersk on the left, two container ships. And you're probably thinking, well, okay, Zim has smaller, you know, Maersk is more global, but no, not at all. So here's the difference. And I'll tell you right now, as I, as I address you guys, the issue is, is that Zim is considered a light asset carrier or an asset light carrier. And Maersk is considered an asset heavy carrier. So, okay. So what's the difference? Well, Believe it or not, other than one vessel, Zim does not own any of their own vessels, less except the one vessel. Maersk owns a good number or vast majority of their, their vessels. Zim does not own their containers. Maersk owns a bulk of their containers. So the point I'm trying to make here with Zim versus Maersk is that Zim plays the leasing market. They're like the Airbnb of a container shipping. They really are. Uh, they go out and they work with uh, Deneos, which is a, a Greek charter company, which also owns part of Zim. They charter vessels, they lease the containers. And so you're thinking, oh, smart move, carry less costs on, less asset costs on your P&L, um, you know, play the market, you know, don't worry about heavy assets on your books. Whereas Maersk's argument would be, well, hey, you know, um, you know, I can accrue these uh, costs over time. It's better to have the asset and to lease it in a in a leasing market that is going crazy. So, I think that uh, it's really interesting in that um, if you're going to look at kind of a pure play, right, in the Trans-Pacific Container Geddon Market, as I call it. It's interesting to note that Zim right now has about 52 percent, thanks to uh, uh, some great reporting um, uh, in freight waves that uh, Zim has 52% of their assets in the Trans-Pacific. And, um, you know, Maersk, MSC, CMA, they're all global carriers. Not that Zim is not a global carrier, but uh, Zim has uh, is a real good play. I mean, I'm, and again, I'm not a stock analyst or do I play one on TV, but if you're looking for a, a way to play the... Um, really high trans-Pacific rates and container getting, Zim as a uh, investment is something that some people look at and say, okay, what's the, you know, it's the next best thing in playing, you know, almost like a trans-Pacific index, right? Because Zim is gonna make all their money on the freight rates. Freight, rate, freight rates are really high. Zim is gonna prosper. Freight rate, rates go down. You know the delta between Zim's uh, freight rates and their charter costs. You know is going to help uh, determine their profits, right? So Zim to me is really interesting. They just went public on the market. They came out as an IPO, um, I think about two weeks ago, and they came out at about eleven dollars a share. They were forecasted to come out at about fifteen, and they zoomed from eleven to twenty uh, bucks in less than two weeks. So like seventy four percent. So if you were savvy to catch that move, um, you know, Zim really paid off. And, and some analysts uh, that I follow believe the uh, best may be yet to come for Zim since they really haven't done any road shows to promote them, themselves and the difference between themselves as a light asset carrier versus a heavy asset carrier. And so there's a lot of, uh, some people think there's a lot of upside with Zim. Some people think there's some downside because you know, they are uh, somewhat uh, controlled by um, state of Israel and that uh, uh, there are some regulations and some debt and some some other um, uh, ownership issues in, in Zim that could um, potentially negate that exciting run that they're having on their stock. So I think Zim is, is definitely uh, an interesting company to follow. Um, I like their niche, you know, in terms of where they go in a market to try to maximize the, the freight lift and the freight rates and try to kind of catch that wave, you know, so to speak. And I think that's what Greg Miller, a, a very talented journalist at Freight Waves had captured in his article that um, Zim has 52% uh, of its capacity in the Trans-Pacific trade, which is hella good in my opinion. I think that uh, I have tons of new respect for Zim and what they did with the IPO. Um, you know, you look at Maersk and, you know, I think Maersk is, you know, 
they've consistently kind of uh, mitigated how strong their market is, right? They don't want to get the analyst, the stock analyst expectations too high. And, and I think that we really need to promote container getting. And, and, and I think that by getting more of the general community invested, you know, in, in, in shipping, right? Look at the Reddit crowd. Um, we're starting to draw a lot of attention to container shipping. But sometimes we're drawing it for the wrong reason. You know, and we start to think about uh, Q4 2020. And there was a study, uh, I think it was uh, Standard & Poor's or Pangeva or a few other uh, people had contributed to. And the study has come out that showed that in the Q4 2020, over $10 billion were added to corporate costs for primarily ocean shipping. $10 billion. Wow. And, you know, when you think about that, so much of that came at uh, the cost of spot rates versus, you know, contracts that were, you know, gone by the wayside. So, you know, everyone was 3Xing their, their, uh, their cost of doing business. And I know that uh, um, Tapestry, which is, you know, um, a holding company for Coach and Kate Spade, their CEO came out and uh, she talked about the fact that they um, had exceeded, you know, their expectations but at the same time, they stressed uh, the higher freight and the shipping constraints that they were dealing with. And I think when you start to think about um, you know, Q1 2021 and, and beyond, we're going to still see that effect. As a matter of fact, I think that when you think about what's happening, I think shippers had planned for about 5 to 10% of their cargo to be at the spot environment. And really, it's happened to be at around, at around 25%. And I think there's no way really to insulate these higher ocean expenses, not to mention um, just the craziness that's happening in terms of uh, invoices being dealt out like playing cards at a Caesars, you know, blackjack table. You know, here's one for twenty five hundred. Oh, here's the next one for thirty five hundred. Here's the next one for forty five hundred. And, you know, they're all within 30 days. And, you know, there's a two thousand dollar deviation in the rates. And the importer is just like rubber stamp, paid, 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 right? Or approved, 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 because they want to keep their cargo going and they don't want to slow down, nor can they afford to slow down their own dispute management process, right? That's one of the things that I've seen uh, as uh, the, on the professional side at, at Ocean Audit. And it's one of the things I'm trying to cure with um, my new free vessel voyage, where I give, uh, give the uh, chance to have uh, some cost re uh, reconciliation for beneficial cargo owners, so they pay the right rate the first time, uh, every time. You know, I think that the one thing that we have seen is that the importers have not necessarily been willing, right, to pass the costs on to the consumers, right? So they're not willing to pass the cost on, right? It's pretty interesting. And I think that we haven't seen price hikes yet. But as we start to think about, is it really that bad out there? You know, we kind of think about the passing of the cost on. And when you look at, let's say, I don't know, um, a, a container of uh, sweaters, right? 25,000 pieces, um, you know, at the old rate of $3,000 and say 25,000 sweaters at $8,000. Um, you know, the landed cost on the ocean component for the, uh, the, the, the old rate of 3000 might be 12 cents a unit. And for right now, it might be 32 cents a unit. So you say to yourself, oh, 12 cents versus 32 cents. So you could kind of say, well, it's half good, half bad. And um, yeah, there you see on the slide there. And I think it's really interesting that um, <laughs> here's the thing, right? It's like, I've been a customer of Amazon since day one, right? And I think that there is such a thing as dynamic pricing, right, in retail. I mean, I could go online and I could see a, um, I don't know, a mouse, right, for um, $99.72. And if my neighbor goes online, maybe he sees it for $99.98, right? Because, I don't know, it's just the way that, you know, retailers can price in different markets. So if you're looking at, and again, I'm not saying, look, I'm not taking the side of the shipper. I'm not say, taking the side of the, uh, the container industry, or I'm not taking the side of the economy, or I'm not taking the side of what COVID's done to ocean rates. All I'm saying is that 
you know, to go from three thousand dollar to eight thousand dollar rate, it's really dramatic to the bottom line. And you know, those unit costs go way up. But you're really asking at some point the consumer to take a a twenty percent. I'm sorry, a twenty set increase, right, on that sweater or a pair of jeans or whatever, whatever it is. And I think when you factor in um, what the Biden administration and what, what uh, other administrations, not necessarily in the U.S. but around the world, might be doing for, you know, stimulus relief, I think one of the reasons why container getting is where, where it's at. Ah, this is really interesting, right? I think the reason why these things are coming in like hotcakes is that smart importers like Tapestry, like Dix, like Zenus, like Ambo, like Icon, like Precut, like Virgin, like Edsel. They know that there's going to be some relief in sight, and they're, they're betting on the come, right? That it's going to happen. That uh, these stimulus checks, you know. So yeah, okay, I'm going to bring it in. I'm going to have higher costs, and Wall Street better damn be ready for me to report, you know, that I didn't quite hit their target because I've got you know X million in ocean over it over my budget. I mean, we had 10 billion in corporate costs greater in Q4 2020 than the previous uh, year-to-date quarter. And I, I just think that retailers, right? I think retailers are not quite ready to pass the cost on. Not yet, right? I think that they don't want the negative PR. I don't think that they want to get the um, pressure, right, from retailer groups or from consumer groups. But I think that like an Amazon, right, how do you really know, right? If um, Steve's getting the mouse for ninety nine dollars and twenty two cents, and Sally down the street's getting it for ninety nine dollars and ninety eight cents, where Amazon's actually making more on Sally than Steve, and really offsets the freight costs. So it's a very, very, very interesting dynamic to the container market that we don't always talk about or think about, but I think you know one that. Uh, but one that definitely is uh, prevalent and needs to be on the conversation table today. I think especially with the new contracts coming up in negotiations as we speak, we're all in for some really big numbers compared to what we had last year. So Q2 may be the, the quarter where we start to see these costs passed on, but also, right? where you start to see some of the bigger stimulus coming in. So ergo, that would mean that container getting goes, and again, I've said this once and I say it again, goes throughout all of 2021. Everyone on LinkedIn says, oh, give it another six to eight weeks, right? No, no, that's not how it's gonna work. It's not gonna play out that way. It's gonna play out exactly as I prescribed it here. And it's not because I have a TV show and they don't. It's just the fact that I think, you know, having the uh, ability to see this in the uh, in the uh, nomenclature really uh, tells it like it is. Um, and of course, you know, we've got other things to consider. Fuel costs are coming up. We've got other other things, that, other things that are hiking up pricing. We've got to really be careful on the fuel. So I just wanted to share that with my audience. It's uh, there's just so much more to talk about. Uh, we've got FDA issues. We've got food and drug, we've got more con contaminated food and products coming into the country than we know what to deal with because we just don't have the bandwidth in the, in the inspectors. Keep following me on LinkedIn. You've been watching Navigate B2B. This has been a special edition on container ships and the next steps. And thank you again for joining me today. I'm Steve Ferreira, CEO of Ocean Audit, host of Navigate B2B. Look for me on Supply Chain Week and Global Maritime Week and wishing you all wonderful weekend. Thanks, everybody.